All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in the interest of staying on time because I know we're all looking forward to the reception after this. Hopefully you all enjoyed our plenary. It was very inspiring as always. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the Novel Virtual Psychosocial Interventions Showcase Workshop. Um, thank you so much for coming and attending the late afternoon session. Hopefully you've all had some extra coffee. I'm Jennifer Busher. I'm from CS Mott Children's Hospital, the University of Michigan, and I'm very pleased to be co-moderating today with Shana Blair from Children's Hospital of Atlanta, Emory University. So um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Please put any questions in the Q&A portion of the NACFC app. Um, as you're listening to the speakers, we'll have each speaker talk for 15 minutes and then about eight minutes of questions afterwards. And we um, just have to disclose that both Shana and I have TF Foundation support. So it's so great to see everyone back in person at NACFC. Um, but we all recognize that virtual interventions are here to stay. And there's a lot of good that comes out of them, especially for people with CF. Um, it allows them to come together to participate in interventions. And it also helps people participate in interventions who may live a long geographic distance from their CF center. However, there's also potential barriers to virtual interventions, including um, difficulty building rapport, potentially, and also, we don't really know too much about how our in-person interventions will work virtually in terms of efficacy. So we're really excited to present um, five novel um, and very creative um, presentations today about interventions that have been developed to look at you know, what can we do virtually and how does it work to help people with CF to thrive. Um, these projects are all very unique and creative, and they're sure to increase our toolbox of support for our patients and families. So to start off, we're going to invite up Emily Muther. She's an associate professor at Children's Hospital of uh, Colorado, thank you. <laughs> and she's going to be talking to us about training CF team members to deliver a behavioral telehealth intervention to improve adherence in adolescents and young adults with CF. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> thank you, mighty crowd in the afternoon. All righty. Okay, so uh, like Shane and Jennifer, I also receive funding from the foundation, one of which is grant support for a study that I'm going to be sharing today. So I'm going to be talking about a telecoaching intervention to improve adherence in adolescents and young adults with CF, which is a summary of the name of our study. I think in, um, this really is um, a telehealth intervention that we are using to look at um, adherence as a primary outcome for adolescents and adults, uh, I'm sorry, adolescents and young adults with CF. So the objective of the study was to develop and evaluate a new patient-centered and practical telehealth intervention to improve adherence in adolescents and young adults with CF. And as we were developing this study as well as thinking about the intervention, which I should say was in development prior to COVID. So the, the purpose and intent of this study and intervention always was to look at, at, at testing this intervention in a telehealth format. But really we know, as all of us know, CF is burdensome. There are a lot of interventions that have been looked at and considered, and some of us maybe that um, we implement in our own clinical setting to try to improve adherence. But we know that a one-size-fits-all approach is not always the best case. And so these interventions should be individualized and collaborative, working with not only us as the clinicians, but also our, care our patients. We also know that this sort of intervention should be educational and behavioral in nature. So there's a lot in the literature that suggests that one or the other is not sufficient. But providing both education and behavioral interventions and support is really the ideal model. And that we felt like that 
that this intervention should be patient-centered, flexible, and goal-oriented. So I probably don't have to say, um, adolescents and young adults with CF are at an increased risk of non-adherence. We know the results, the impact, the outcome of that increased risk of non-adherence, not only on their mental health, well-being, quality of life, but also on their physical health and CF-specific outcomes. And so tailoring an evidence-based intervention to be patient-specific to address their own individual and unique barriers to improve adherence and health outcomes was really at the core of this study. So not developing an intervention that we were gonna kind of uniformly try to implement across all of our patients, but really thinking about what can be flexible. How can we tailor this in a way that really meets the individual needs of our patients? So I'm gonna talk mostly today about an aspect of the study that involved training CF care team members to be coaches. But before I get to that, I want to speak a little bit more about the intervention, which we have called telecoaching. So telecoaching is led by CF care team members. These are members of all different disciplines. So it's not just social workers and psychologists with, with behavioral um, or experience in behavioral interventions. It's really a lot of different disciplines on the care team. It's a series of virtual coaching sessions. It addresses specific individual barriers, as I've mentioned, and telecoaching was meant to be brief and really skill-based. What telecoaching is not is that it's not led only by mental health trained clinicians. So you'll see that those, of, those um, who participated in this study as coaches were not just social workers and psychologists. It's also not meant to be emotional support or counseling. We call this coaching for a reason, and so it's not therapy, it's not some of the um, emotional support that we provide in clinic, this is meant to be different. It's also not meant to be healthcare advice. So we were very clear as we were developing this intervention that we were trying to set limits and boundaries around how we manage and navigate when there are questions about an individual's healthcare so that we could refer patients back to their healthcare team. And it was really meant to be brief, so not lengthy. So this is just an overview of the intervention so that you can see it was 25 weeks, so um, a long time, a, a lot of sessions over the course of time, but each session was really meant to be brief. It was about 20 to 30 minutes in length. And you can see that session one and session two were universal. Every participant in this study, every patient I should say, received an introduction session where they learned about what is this telecoaching intervention. And then they received, the second session was with their coach going over SMART goals. So helping them set realistic expectations, helping them identify the goals that they wanted to work on as it related to adherence. And those goals were created using a standardized measure called the CFCBS that we use to track certain aspects of their care where they might be struggling or feeling like they were less able to, to manage. And then sessions three, th three through 10 are meant to be flexible. So this was sort of the menu of, of, sesh of options that coach and patient could decide on what they would focus on. So you can see they're very behavioral, they're very skills based, and the coach and the participant would decide what each session was going to cover based again on their individual barriers that they reported got in the way of managing their specific, their specific aspect of their treatment. So a coach and a participant could spend one week on problem solving. They could spend three weeks on problem solving. They may get through, I don't know that we had any coaches get through all of these modules, but they may cycle through them very quickly or they may spend a majority of the time on one or two of these specific topics based on, again, the needs of the participant. And then every um, coach and participant had a final wrap-up session. So now to talk just a little bit about our coaches who were actually considered participants as well in the study. So we had patients um, who were participants and then coaches, CF care team members who were working with their patients who were also considered participants. So these coaches were non-physician and as I've mentioned, not all necessarily trained in behavior change or behavioral skills. So some of these um, coaches had, were outside of the social worker psychology discipline. The coaches were asked to partner with our participants to teach CF skills that addressed specific behaviors. 
So those were things like forgetting treatments, choosing not to do treatments, um, or not doing treatments that were necessarily recommended in a certain way by their care team. And here's just a little bit of breakdown on who our coaches were with some demographic information. So you can see we, had, we enrolled 15 care team members to serve as coaches across our sites in the study. You can see that the majority of them were female. Um, you can notice that if you look at the pie chart, the different breakdown of discipline. So we had um, respiratory therapists, we had a pharmacist, we had dietitians, social workers and psychologists, as well as registered nurses. I mentioned we enrolled 15 coaches to be participants and serve as coaches in the study. We did have four coaches that withdrew, and you can see on that bottom um, table there, the majority of the reasons for withdrawing from this study was really just leaving their institution. We had one coach um, who, who had a time, commit, or time burden that wasn't able to fulfill the role of the coach. And then you can see the length of time that our coaches have spent working um, in, on the CF care team with the majority of them being at least three to five years. So now to get to the training, which I want to spend the rest of my time talking about. And this is really how we trained CF care team members to deliver a flexible, virtual, behavioral intervention to work on adherence. And so this, um, the training was really developed and led by myself and another psychologist colleague who were both co-investigators on this study. Um, we started off with a very <laughs> packed one day of training to fit in. You saw all of those different behavioral skills and modules that we included in our, in our um, intervention. And so we really built a very, very busy day, one day of training, and realized right after that one day of training ended that we needed to break it up into a couple different days. And so I'll show you how we did that. But we included both synchronous virtual training as well as asynchronous. So to really be consistent with the way that the intervention was being delivered in a virtual format, we trained the majority of our coaches in a virtual format. So we spent time with the coaches over the course of one to three days, not only providing didactic instruction on the study and the intervention, but also creating experiential practice to learn what is it like to talk about problem solving or to go through the importance of communication or social support with participants. And we included role plays and practice, which you'll see. And then we had a lot of training materials. So we anticipated that this was really going to be not only an intense one, two, or three days of training, but then to take all of this information that for a lot of our coaches was new or not necessarily something that they used every day in their clinical setting to have materials that they could refer back to. So that included a binder with a lot of information and all of the materials that we went over in um, our training. And then we had a post-training knowledge assessment, which I'll share some of the data. So this is just to show you how crazy maybe we were at thinking we could go over all of this in one day. Um, this is a very busy, packed day. Um, our wonderful coaches who went through phase one of training gave us a lot of feedback that really we need to break this up. So we listened and we moved things um, across several days so that they could really absorb the information. We also, as I've mentioned, didn't have just didactic instruction, but gave these coaches a lot of opportunity to practice these skills, to watch videos, to watch myself and the other psychologist um, role play what these skills and sessions could look like, and then to also watch um, or practice with vignettes themselves. This is just day three where we really broke them out and had time going over each module, again, with the didactic instruction and the role play. And so this is just sort of a snapshot of what some of our work looked like. You can see on those first screenshots, myself and Jenny Lindwall, the other psychologist who trained our coaches, um, doing this virtually, going through some of the information that we provided. One of the things that was also helpful is creating um, in teams a sort of um, uh, tool kit where they were able to access a lot of this information, which made it feel maybe a little bit less overwhelming. And so we wanted to evaluate the training to understand, um, in addition to how effective this intervention might be, how feasible is it to train non-behaviorally trained CF care team members to talk with patients about adherence using behavioral, evidence-based behavioral skills? 
And so if you start looking down at the bottom, we did a post-training knowledge assessment where we asked individuals to complete a knowledge assessment based on some of the information we went over in our training. And you can see that the mean score on our post-training knowledge assessment was 91. So that's an A minus A in my book. So I think most of our coaches passed. We did offer opportunities for retake and only two coaches passed on re needed to pass on retake. And then this just breaks down the different cohorts of training so that you can see um, the different rounds and the, the days that we provided our training. In addition to looking at knowledge assessment after the training of the coaches, we also looked at satisfaction. And so we asked several questions about, um, as a dietitian, as a respiratory therapist or a nurse, how did you experience this training? Did you feel prepared? How helpful was this information? How helpful were the, um, the handouts that we provided, the didactic instruction? And you can see, really, for the most part, um, we, we kind of tilted onto the positive side of things. There were some aspects where we realized that this was really pretty, um, I think, a steep learning curve for some of our coaches to learn how to deliver these interventions. One, when we're almost done enrolling participants and collecting data in this study, and I'm really excited next in ACFC to hopefully have data to share the impact of the intervention as well as um, the experience of our coaches after they've gone through the intervention to share um, how they felt. The other thing I want to just quickly mention is we didn't just assume that a one to three day training and getting um, you know coaches feeling nice, nice and anxious about doing all of this was going to be sufficient. We also wanted to provide ongoing support. And so all of our coaches continued to receive monthly supervision. That was done, again, virtually. It was also done in a group setting. So either myself or the other psychologist led group supervision with the coaches. There were um, usually two to four or five coaches who participated in those monthly supervision sessions. You can see kind of a general agenda that we usually had, um, as well as how many supervision sessions we have done to date. So this is quite a bit. Um, these supervision ses sessions lasted about an hour each month where we went over difficulties, challenges, practicing the intervention, talking about things that might be difficult, getting participants to stay engaged, building rapport, that sort of thing. And um, we wanted to know not only do coaches show up for this supervision because this is a lot to ask, but how engaged are they? How much did they participate in these supervision sessions? And so you can see um, both myself and the other trainer, the other psychologist, rated each coach's engagement in these supervision sessions. And they were really, for the most part, pretty engaged, close to um, very engaged in terms of an average. And then finally, um, just to show you how hard our coaches are working at delivering a very comprehensive behavioral intervention in a virtual setting, you can see that our coaches have currently conducted 206 sessions with participants where they've worked through um, a number of different sessions covering a lot of those skills that I mentioned, um, completing um, a lot of different sessions, as I mentioned, getting through those different modules. And I just want to thank all of our collaborators, especially the foundation, those at Boston Children's who helped make sure that we're running it the way that we need to, Johns Hopkins and our different sites who are participating in the study. And I can take questions if there are any. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Emily. One of the first questions um, was, how did you recruit and retain so many coaches for this program? That's a great question. So I, I'm, I can't remember if I mentioned that this study was being conducted under the STRC, which is an adherence consortium through the foundation. It stands for Success with Therapies Research Consortium. So part of our ability to recruit coaches involved really enrolling them as participants and being able to provide some support for their time to serve in this role. So I think that helps in a lot of ways. But really this study is a pilot and feasibility study. So we are really wanting to look at, once we're done collecting data, how feasible is this 
maybe not a 11 module session that we're all doing um, outside of our clinic time, but are there aspects of these behavioral skills, these modules, these, this intervention that might be relevant for all of us across disciplines that we can use in our coach setting or in our clinical setting? But I think for the purposes of this, it was really um, recruiting and retaining par um, coaches as participants in a larger study where we funded some of their time. So this is a related question, and uh, you may have addressed part of it because um, funding um, and um, sort of that buying of time for people to participate. Um, but how did coaches integrate this into their workload? Um, or maybe what have you learned about um, how coaches of various disciplines have done this? It's a wonderful question, and I think um, a really important question, especially as we think, too, about feasibility. And, um, you know, I just mentioned maybe the, the hope is when we're done recruiting and collecting data for this study that there are aspects of this intervention that can be delivered in a, you know, 15-minute clinic visit. But that was not the purpose of this study. It was really, you know, a, um, a very structured intervention. And so I think that um, to think about... You know, how can, you know, scheduling is really important and really important not only for us as, as clinicians but as um, for our participants. And so there was a lot of flexibility that we had to afford and think about what fit within, you know, the day-to-day -day of our coaches but also what worked with our participants. When we think about adolescents and young adults, they're in school. Um, they often have extracurricular activities outside of school. And so we really, part of our supervision sessions, our monthly supervision sessions, was working with coaches to problem solve how to be creative and flexible with timing. Um, we did have some coaches who were able to flex some of their time, and so maybe they came in later and did a coaching session at 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon to meet um, with participants. But I, I, I think for the most part, all of our coaches were able to fit this in within their regular work day. Do you see the training being applicable to other areas of CF other than treatment adherence? Yes, I think, um, you know, I think the training itself, we learned a lot from modifying it in our initial version of a very intense one day to thinking about the importance of having not just one chance to train any of us on any topic, but really being able to have a cohort of colleagues and peers that we can learn together with and learn um, what, what kind of nuances exist in our own clinical settings. And so that's really what the supervision has allowed, that it's not you know, just me as the, tr as the trainer kind of showing up with an agenda, but being able to continue to talk about this is what's been difficult or this is how I figured out how to reach my you know, 17-year-old patient who never answers their phone and only does TikTok. And so I think that... <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I think that um, this sort of a training, this sort of an intervention, thinking about being the flexibility is the piece that I say is, I would think is most adaptable to some of the other things that we do, whether it's um, checking in on um, recommendations that we make in clinic, whether it's recommendations of the physical therapist or the pharmacist or the social worker. Um, how can we be flexible in our approaches and working with patients um, texting is something that I think uh, oftentimes can reduce some of those barriers, and so we really have had to think about that too as part of this training and study. Okay, two more questions. Um, one is, how will you evaluate how coaching was received by patients? So that's sort of the, the next yeah, piece of the Stay study. tuned. Come to NACFC next year. <laughs> um, but we are evaluating it, and that is, is, you know, one of the primary outcomes is adherence. And so that is one of the ways we're hoping to look at if this intervention is effective at helping to improve adherence. Does the relationship with a coach um, who likely these patients know from their care setting, who's functioning in a different role, does that help? Does talking about skill-based strategies to reduce or address some of their unique barriers. And so, um, you know, for some participants, it's hard for them to do their best because they don't notice a difference when they do it versus when they don't. But for other participants, the reason they don't do their best is because they don't like the way it feels or they don't understand why it matters. And so those specific reasons, this intervention was developed to provide different skills based on those specific barriers. And so I think that 
hopefully um, we'll see that having a flexible approach where we can meet with patients um, when they're in their car or at home virtually will help us reduce some of the barriers that exist of three-month visits trying to address adherence. So this last question has two parts. Um, it, well, first there's a commentary. Love this idea. Um, and did you design each lesson for the coaching sessions? And are these available? Are these available to be shared? Um, we did design each session. Um, it took many, many months to years to really create this intervention. Um, I mentioned a lot of this is ev our evidence-based skills, but the unique aspect of this intervention, as I've kind of beaten the dead horse now, is that it's really tailored to what the patient is struggling with. So we don't go through each of those modules that I shared, you know, first at problem solving, then social support, then communication, then health beliefs. We really understand what's getting in the way for the patient and we move around within all of those different skills to, to provide that. And so we created, I don't know, I, Evelyn would know how many pages our intervention is, but it's many pages um, and it took quite a while, but I think it is, uh, it's helpful to have, again, it doesn't need to go from start to finish, but to really use those tools um, and, and chunks of those of the tools and the intervention that we created in a way that's meaningful for patients. But it, it, did, take, it did take a bit. Well, thank you so much, Emily, Dr. Muther. Um, 206 sessions is uh, quite an incredible accomplishment. Um, so thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Audrey Toluchek uh, with the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Nursing. Her presentation is titled Bright Beginnings, Early Intervention for Parents of Newly Diagnosed Infants. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for staying uh, to, for these presentations. First of all, um, uh, we have no conflicts of interest to report, and this project was funded through the generosity of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So this is a program that I have been dreaming of, frankly, since we started doing some newborn screening for cystic fibrosis back in the 80s. And over the years, I've had the great fortune of running into um, Lisa Green, who is an amazing person and um, wonderful mother of two just incredible now young adults with, um, who just also happen to have cystic fibrosis. And she shared my interest and passion for supporting these families and we've teamed up and included another nurse in the project and uh, voila, we now have bright beginnings. So I'm just delighted to share this with you today. If I can just get my... Okay, this isn't going forward. Okay. Okay, technology is not my forte. It's still not going. Okay. Okay, this will work. Okay. So the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis is life-changing at, at any age, but it can be particularly daunting when it happens during the neonatal phase. So I, I, I'll share with you a story from my early experience as a, a nurse working with newly diagnosed um, parents um, when we started um, screening for CF in the 80s. I remember a mom telling me, she had a child diagnosed through newborn screening with CF, and she said, you know, Audrey, I have two children, one who has CF and one who doesn't. Both are healthy, but I find myself thinking about the child with CF differently than I think of my child who doesn't have CF, and I wonder how this has affected my relationship with that child. And um, that actually inspired my whole career of, of research to take a look at her question. That was so very insightful. And the research actually shows that she was right. Um, a neonatal diagnosis can exacerbate um, postpartum depressive symptoms and anxiety. Our research shows that um, parents of children with cystic fibrosis are less likely to breastfeed than parents who, don't, who have a child who doesn't have CF. 
And um, bottle feeding is associated with more task-oriented, less sensitive caregiving. And parents of children who um, were bottle fed actually view their children as less attached to them. So there can be a, a whole a domino effect based on one event. So these parents really need support. Um, the SIA Foundation did um, the parent and family experience of care. Are you, may, you know about that, where they collected data from surveys parents completed, and we had an opportunity to take a look at those data. And it showed that during that first year following the diagnosis, parents struggle to figure things out and sometimes feel isolated in that struggle. They deeply value the um, support and guidance that they receive from CF care providers, but they often feel that those providers are at a loss for how to deal with some of the day-to-day -day issues of living with a child who has cystic fibrosis. Um, and then finally, Lisa actually conducted an, a needs assessment some years ago and where she surveyed parents of children of all ages, including adolescents, and asked them if retrospectively they might have attended a program like this. And 80% said that they would. Okay, this is not going forward for me. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, we also conducted um, a systematic review of the literature to find out what parents of children with chronic illnesses, including but not limited to cystic fibrosis, need during that first year following diagnosis. And what we found was they need assistance dealing with the emotional turmoil. They need essential knowledge and practical skills. They also want individualized information that's tailored based on their particular child. They, and they want it delivered with a sense of empathy and reassurance. They also want easy access to providers, including specialists, between scheduled visits. And finally, and perhaps even most importantly, they want a sense of hope about their child's future. Okay, let's see if it's gonna work. What am I doing wrong here? Okay, um, so, then we, with support from the CF Foundation, we had an opportunity to pilot test Bright Beginnings. Um, so we tested the feasibility, acceptability, and potential benefits. And we got positive results for all three. Um, this was an eight module um, uh, program. Um, so parents could access information online, but then they also attended weekly live sessions that were co-facilitated by Lisa and the nurse who I just mentioned. Um, that included six mothers of children um, under the age of 12, but then we also asked parents of older children to review the online material and give us feedback. 100% of the parents who participated in this said that they would recommend the program. The parents of the infants also reported after the intervention that um, they had decreased depressive symptoms and anxiety. They felt that they gained peer support from the live sessions. They were using coping strategies that were offered to them during the intervention, but there was no change in measures of family resilience or communication. Parents also gave us some really great feedback about um, what they liked and what we could improve. Most of the improvement recommendations were, it was too much information, can you, can you just decrease it a little bit? Okay. It's not working. Okay. So here are some, here are some comments from parents. Um, from Lisa's survey, one of the parents said, through rain, sleet, or snow, I would have been the first, the first there and one of the last to leave. The most common comment from the Parent Advisory Committee for the Bright Beginnings program was, I wish a program like this had been available when, I, my, when my child was diagnosed. And from one of the parents who actually participated in the entire program, online and live sessions, this parent reflected some of the other comments from other parents in that she said, um, Bright Beginnings is almost like a welcome to CF group. 
It gives you a chance to learn and understand what your children are facing on a daily basis. And it gives you a chance to speak with other people who know exactly what you are going through. It takes away your fear of loneliness and your fear of the unknown. It truly allows you to open the door to CF and to walk through without being terrified of what you may encounter. I have done many groups and Bright Beginnings was by far has been my favorite and by far the most helpful. Okay, so based on um, feedback from these parents, um, we are in the process of revising uh, the program in our new and improved Bright Beginnings program, which we plan to launch in January, will continue to build communities of support for parents helping them understand the emotional roller coaster, develop coping and self-care skills, and work in partnership with providers, as well as feel hopeful about their, their children's future. Okay. Um, we will also, um, this program will continue to be theoretically driven, empirically based, and parent informed, thanks to having Lisa. And okay, now it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and partner in Bright Beginnings, Lisa Green. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, I'll be able to, to run the clicker. Yeah, so as Audrey mentioned, our pilot started with eight modules, but um, for this program, we're starting with five of the most popular and salient based on what the parents, um, they're on their feedback. And so they include growing personal resilience um, and expertise, coping, how to talk about with CF about others. That was a, an interesting and sort of unique um, topic. Uh, you know, how to share your story, developing your own story, who to talk with about your story and when. I mean, how we share the diagnosis is really critical because you can't take that information back. And so um, parents really like that. Um, and then building relationships with care teams, which as, as we know is, is super important. So doing some communication skills um, on, on that. Whoa, okay, there we go. <laughs> So as Audrey mentioned, we have, um, to, uh, the format is both self-guided, asynchronous, and synchronous. And so the self-guided part, um, we, we used a platform at UW-Madison, which we are no longer able to use. So we're going to be using um, Moodle, which um, hopefully some of you are familiar with. But it's a learning management system, kind of like Blackboard or Canvas. It's very well known. A lot of parents know it because they use it with their kids. And many of you may actually be familiar with it as well. And it'll include skill building through, we've got some great video clips from um, a wide variety of there's parents, there's a dad, um, there's a couple with children with CF, there's people with CF talking about their experiences. Um, and so we've got uh, great information there. We've got readings, <clears throat> we've got interactive materials. And the nice thing is the, the asynchronous materials, they're accessible at the parents' convenience, and they can move around kind of like um, the other talk we heard, you know, the, at needs-based, right? It's like, what do I need to learn right now? What, what's important to me right now? So they can do any order that they want. And all at, at different points all throughout um, the, the, the program, there's, there's little evaluation prompts so that we can figure out, was this helpful? What did you like? What didn't you like? And so um, we'll be continuing to gather data as we go along there. And then for the live synchronous sessions, um, we were doing it weekly when we did the pilot program, but that was a lot. I mean, it was a huge commitment. So we're gonna do it a little different this time, and of course we'll evaluate it. And so I will be the facilitator, yours truly. And I think we're gonna do it on Sunday afternoons because having delivered parenting classes for like many years, like 15 or plus years, Sunday afternoons just seem to be the sweet spot <clears throat> that we can get the most parents most of the time. <coughs> And I'll be, um, um, I'll be inviting guest speakers. So some of you I know in the room, or just watch out, I got your name. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, and we'll, we'll be having parent discussion. So really, the, the facilitated time is really about, let's talk about what you want to talk about. And certainly, you know, we'll figure out who's, you know, gone through which module, but we'll kind of work through some of that. But I really just want to be there and open up discussion and dialogue. And so um, we'll be focused on building support and really normalizing the CF experience. And so these um, monthly chats will be about an hour. And we're launching the program on January 10th. And so that's going to be when we're opening it up to the, the entire CF community. And so um, our biggest ask is really going to be help and getting the word out about it. So um, that's going to be just, you know, I think the hardest part is just get letting, getting people, um, you know, to know about it. So, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we're going to be doing five modules. Um, the first one is about growing your resilience, expertise, and hope. I hope is a really important um, um, piece of this, obviously. Um, sharing our story, I kind of already talked about that. Um, understanding our emotions, understanding um, that, you know, um, like emotions, grief, the grief process is, is not bad and being sad is not bad and how to cope with those emotions, understanding the cycle of chronic sorrow and just understanding, you know, grief and recognizing when just the normal grieving process moves into something deeper like depression or post-traumatic stress or anxiety that de deserves professional attention. I'm not a therapist, so it's not therapy, and certainly um, we will refer, um, but uh, that's our, our, our goal. Um, and then, of course, coping with the emotional roller coaster, coping skills, learning how to take care of ourselves, and um, identifying how to deal with um, difficult feelings and stress. And we also talk a lot about wellness, and this is about preventative education. And so what can we do to take care of ourselves? And, and really giving parents the permission to take good care of themselves, especially during that time when you've got a newborn, it's so hard um, to do that. <clears throat> and then um, the last module that we'll be working with this year is building partnerships with your care team. So obviously that in the very beginning especially is so critical, and we want to learn, we want to help parents learn how to have conversations with their care teams, how to open up dialogue, how to, to you know, how to create a safe space so that they can be honest and so, um, and learn how to speak up and, and share their needs. And so um, those are the five modules that we'll be starting with, and then we hope to add the other ones as we go on. Um, we'll be using readings, illustrations, and writing prompts, lots of different ways of learning. We'll be using quizzes and interactive activities. These are some of the um, screenshots from the current program as we have it now, but we'll be converting that into Moodle, so it'll be similar. So we want it to be fun, and we want it to be interactive, and there's little puzzles and writing prompts and you know ways for people to take notes, and so we hope to recreate that. Um, so it's been quite a journey. Um, this has been something that I've been um, working on for, for many, many years um, as a mom of two young adults with cystic fibrosis now. My, my son is 23, and he actually um, just started medical school at UCSF in California. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So proud. He's wanted to be a doctor, I can't tell you how long, since he was 10. And, so he's, and he's never deviated from that. And then my daughter, she just graduated with a degree in biology from the University of Washington. Funny how they're both in science. but And she's, um, she's working um, full-time, and she's adulting down in San Diego at Bristol-Myers Squibb doing um, cancer research. So... so so proud of both the kids. I mean, they're doing amazing. But, you know, even though things are going well, and certainly Tricaft is a piece of that, but um, even though things are going well, we will never forget. We will never forget the moment of diagnosis, the place, the time, the smells, the sounds, the surreal sense of time. Is this a dream? I wish it was. <laughs> we will never forget the shock the disbelief, the fear, the anger, the tears, the shattered dreams. And we will never forget the prayers, the hugs, the helping hands, the kindness, the love, and the hope. And so many of you are a part of that. And so thank you for being there for us and with us 
during that time of diagnosis as well as through the many, many years, you're like family. You are our family. So, so thank you so much for all that you do. All right, so we have a poster, 308. Um, as I mentioned, Bright Beginnings will be available January 10th. We have a little handout. It's microscopic, but if you have a, if you have a, a magnifying glass, <laughs> um, it was kind of a quick, quick run on my printer, but, and they're just here down front if someone would like one. We'd be happy to hand that out. Um, and you can contact us at Bright Beginnings for you too. Took us a while to be able to get that. <laughs> so we had to go through a lot of different iterations, but Bright Beginnings for you too at gmail.com. And so we'll be monitoring that and um, would love to have your questions and your feedback. And definitely um, please watch for um, information we're going to send out to the CF clinics. I mean, that's where we're going. Um, and of course, to the community. I'll work through the community directly and just launch this thing. So we're really excited about it. So. Um, thank you so much, and we are, oops, well, That's ready okay. for questions. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa and Audrey. That was really impressive. Um, again, just a, a housekeeping reminder, you can put questions in the Q&A, but we have one from the audience, so if you want to go ahead and ask, did you have a question? Yes, yeah. yes please, go ahead. Um, I'm going to start with, with the, the latter. Um, we, we do plan to collect data. This is not a research project. We're actually doing it as a, uh, a resource for families, and we're making it available to CF centers across the country. So it's not going to have the rigorous empirical data that a research project would, but we are going to collect data. And what was the first question? And we will make sure <laughs> about, that this is that, Hasn't, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so what we're finding, we, the, the answer, the easy answer is yes. We're focusing on the newly diagnosed child during the first year of life. However, we're finding that the content seems to be relevant for other age groups. So we're starting out with that particular age group, and we may build on it if, if this is successful and if we have funding, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, and our original program had um, some parenting modules that were really in mind for, okay, so these are families who have, a, you know, a, up to one year old, but they're going to be hitting the twos pretty soon. So we were doing some, like, preventative education around parenting skills and whatnot. So, and those will come in phase two. So that's our, that's our hope, and we'll be adding that. And as far as the education level, um, so we'll keep it at the standard sixth to seventh grade level um, as best as we can, um, you know, with our, our materials. And that, that's kind of the sweet spot to address that. Um, and I think, did that answer your questions? I, I hope they address thank them. You. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Fowler, you know where to find us if you have more questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please do. So, so that exact question was asked by about four other people, five other people, about okay. whether you'd have modules available for children who were diagnosed at a later age. So yeah, please yeah. make and, those. <laughs> and honestly, our, I mean, my, my heart, my goal is to really provide resources all the way through. I mean, those, I know many of you here, and, and you know that. So I think I'm hoping to be able to build on it over time. I mean, it will take time. This is the beginning. But if this format works really well and people do well and they like it and they're learning and they're, you know, it's helping them, then I would love to add some more robust parenting resources to 
for all ages. And I mean, I'm particularly thinking right now about I really need to work on some resources that are real targeted towards um, te parenting teens with CF, because that's obviously a fantastic presentation earlier. That's a challenge. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have one other question. Um, did you create all new materials, produce the videos, um, put the readings together? I mean, it's a very interactive yeah, it is. program. We did. So. Yeah, we had, amazing, um, we had an amazing team. Grace was on our LMS team, and she was fantastic. And so Audrey, Jen, and I, it, it is a research-based program. I mean, we, we dug into the literature for every sentence in this program. And so it's taken... A lot of time and so yeah we did we did all of it I, I'll just add that we did use available resources for instance there are some modules where we refer back to materials already created by the CF foundation so when something was already there yeah. we, we used it yeah but we did yeah okay. yeah thank you very much all right okay. thank, thank you, you. So speaking of adolescents, uh, we are excited to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Frida Liu from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Seattle Children's, I'm sorry, Washington, not Wisconsin, University of Washington School of Medicine and Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Liu will be presenting on co-designing and acceptance and commitment therapy telehealth group intervention for adolescents with cystic fibrosis. All right, thank you. Okay, let's see if I can manage the clicker here. Uh. <laughs> Try all the buttons. Okay, maybe that's the ticket. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my co-authors and our, my fabulous team and consultants um, down there on the bottom. And um, only thing to disclose is that this work is funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation through the Clinical Pilot Feasibility Award mechanism. Okay, so here's our um, ambitious agenda for today. Uh, I'm gonna very briefly provide a background that most of you will be familiar with, and then we're gonna jump into talking about the phase one of our study, which is co-designing a telehealth group program with teens with CF. So just a little bit about how we arrived at the protocol that we ultimately tested in our randomized feasibility uh, pilot trial. And the intervention that we tested uh, is called Teens Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Involving Cystic Fibrosis, or TACTIC. Um, I didn't explain the ac acronym to the um, teens who participated in the study, but they quite readily ran with it. They said, oh, TACTIC, because we're going to learn different tactic to cope with our depression or anxiety or stressors. I said, exactly. <laughs> and we went on. Uh, and then I hope we'll get to the part where I can talk a little bit about future directions. Okay, so the brief background here, I don't need to belabor the point. I'm sure all of you know that teens with CF uh, are at increased risk for depression and anxiety. And what we know from the behavioral health literature is that acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT, has been shown to be helpful for anxiety and depression, especially with youth with chronic illness. Now, knowing that infection risks really preclude in-person group therapy for youth with CF, we came up with this idea that if we could deliver ACT, a known intervention, in a group format via telehealth, that this would be a really promising and exciting innovation for youth with CF. And just as a side note, we did come up with this before the pandemic. And of course, after the pandemic, everyone thought was like, well, of course you were going to do this. But we did come up with this before the pandemic. So as I mentioned, phase one was to co-design with teens with CF um, our tactic uh, intervention protocol, and then phase two was the small randomized controlled pilot feasibility trial. Oh, that's working out. Okay, I'm going to talk about the co-design at fairly a high level because I want to spend most of our time today on the, um, the meat of the intervention itself because I think that's what folks are interested in. I'm just going to pause for a second and say that my Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's essentially our process for co-designing. We began with the draft of the group protocol developed from the literature. So we pulled from existing um, ACT uh, 
manuals and protocols that were already available for teens and adults, including the um, Act for CF protocol by Dr. Virginia O'Hare and her team um, that many of you may be familiar with from previous NACFCs. And then we uh, recruited a small group of three teens to do a first round focus group. So there was a multi-session focus group. They attended, each session was about one and a half to two and a half hours long, depending on how, I could, uh, how long I could keep the teens engaged and how long their schedules allowed. And so what we did during that time with them was we actually demonstrated most of the primary activities that they would do in, our, in the tactic group and we tested them so that they could tell us how the activity was working. We could get a sense whether it landed well, and they also gave us, um, in addition to a qualitative feedback, they also gave us quantitative ratings about each activity. So we could look at the end of each um, session's material, which things are most likely to do well, and make decisions about what to keep and what to shift and what to let go of. Um, so then we integrated their feedback after the first round of focus groups, and then we uh, invited a second round of teens to join for another set of focus <coughs> groups to then assess the iterated intervention, and then uh, we integrated their feedback, and then finally we arrived at the tactic protocol that we tested for the pilot feasibility trial. So for those of you who are really interested in talking um, or chatting more about co-designing with teens, um, a little plug to join me on Saturday at noon in Ballroom B for that roundtable conversation. Okay, and what we found at the end of our co-design process, and the beauty of using a human-centered design um, approach to iterate through a co-design process, is you get a sense before you run the trial how it's going to go, right? So you kind of, I think of it as cheating a little bit, uh, so that we already have some information from the teens who participated in the co-design process that they rated the program as highly acceptable, appropriate, and feasible. And acceptable is we really like it. Appropriate is we think it's fitting for kids with CF. Um, and feasible means they think it's doable. Okay, so what we landed on for the protocol that we tested was a six week, um, six weekly 60 minute sessions and each of the sessions begins with an what I call on theme mindfulness activity. Uh, on theme meaning it was uh, linked to the topic of the week and I have mindfulness here in quotes because not all the activities were sort of classic meditative um, exercises as you might think of when most people think of mindfulness. Some of them are quite active and engaging so tapping into um, being in the present moment and participatory kinds of exercises. And then we did a check-in on their home practice with the exception of session one when we just primarily oriented to group. Um, and then we briefly introduced the week's topic and my goal was always to not do too much talking here and really dive into the experiential, experiential activity. One of the hallmarks of ACT as an intervention is that it's supposed to be active. You get up and you do stuff and you learn through doing. Um, and then finally we wrap up the session by assigning home practice. And we asked our um, teens to track their home practice on an app. Um, for those who didn't choose to use the app, we always offered a paper pencil format, but I will be honest, none of the kids used the paper pencil format if they didn't use the app. <laughs> um, and we just used the Dailyo, Dailyo app. It happened to be something that was flexible enough for our purposes. All right, um, so I recognize I'm not gonna have enough time to explain ACT as an intervention in and of itself. So for those of you who are familiar with ACT, you might recognize this image on the right as the hexaflex, which reflects the six pillars or six principles of ACT. And you might recognize that um, all of those principles are reflected in our six sessions of the tactic program. So I'm gonna try to explain just a little bit about each pillar as I go through the sessions. We're probably not going to hit all of them um, in terms of being able to do that and tell you about the activities that was in each session, but we're going to do the best we can. Okay, so the first session was really about orienting to group and the primary activity in there um, was this pushing paper exercise uh, that's from Russ Harris. And the idea here is to show them what this group is going to be about. And this exercise is one in which we ask kids to push on a piece of paper as hard as they can um, to uh, demonstrate that you know, we could struggle with all the things that we're trying not to feel, not to think about, whether that's anxiety or, st or other stressors or CF itself, right? We could do this all day long 
and expend all of our energy this way and then not really be able to engage with the things that we really care about, as well as the things that we kind of have to do, like homework and chores and stuff like that, right? Um, or we can try to be with all of this struggle differently. We can try to hold it closer or put that paper on your lap. And this is the way that we use to demonstrate, um, to give folks an idea of the strategies to come in the following weeks. Um, and so you can, you can see myself and um, one of our research coordinators, Gracia, uh, who uh, allowed me to include her picture <laughs> in this slide, and all of our kids in one of our groups trying very hard here. And then in session two, we focused on identifying values. And here we developed essentially a web-based um, application activity <coughs> where they could sort um, a set of 40 values cards into three piles of most important, somewhat important, and not important. And we asked them to rank order the ones that are most important and select the top one that they wanted to focus on for the rest of our group sessions. And these gorgeous photos and cards um, came generously from Dr. Louise Hayes. And she has these in print, and she allowed us to use them digitally for our study. And then we move on to committed action. And the idea here is that um, committed action is really the process of aligning your actions with your values. So we talked about values, and then we move on to a section to say, you know, how do we help you do things and take steps, however small, toward the values that you want to be working on, or the values that you want to further and live more consistently with. And this is an activity that we called Inside Out. And we asked our um, teens, and we did it ourselves as well, to put you know, thoughts and ideas that come into mind that you know, really these are the things that you don't feel comfortable talking about, or these are the things that you'd rather not be thinking about. And there's a little bit of an exposure time where we ask them to hold it up to the camera until someone acknowledges that they've seen it. And then we had them stick it onto themselves. Um, and so we did this for a while until everyone was kind of filled with stickies. And then we played 30 seconds of Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. <laughs> and this is, you see me and uh, my postdoc here just going nuts. And for the keen eye, you might notice that this particular patient is actually participating from her hospital room, um, which was in fact one of the intended effects of our study was that I really wanted to make this accessible. Um, knowing that many of our uh, patients struggle to even maintain an outpatient um, behavioral health care, right? Because they're bouncing in and out of um, inpatient settings. Um, no, noticing my time, I'm just going to keep clipping forward. Um, I'm not even going to go over that very much, but we did cover acceptance and then as well as a variety of diffusion strategies. And then finally, we land on the session that's about self as context. And the idea here is really to help teens recognize that they will go through many seasons of their lives and they will go through lots of changes. Um, but the part of them that stays constant is the part that hears the stories that they tell. And in many contexts, we call this the observing self. And to do this, we gave them an exercise. Um, to, it's just a free writing exercise for two to three minutes to write the story of your life. It has to be a true story. And then they were, and then we went around and shared, and then they were told, now write another story, a completely different story, that is also a true story. And we did this three times. And one of the times I said, I think it's the last time, I said, you know, if you haven't already told the story that involves CF, the invitation is to do that now. And you can and you don't have to. And most of the kids by that point had already told their CF story. And what I want to do right now is just to share some of their words with you um, because this was just so striking for me. Um, so one young woman said, my family was told by the time I was three weeks old that I had CF. I was in the hospital many times as I was growing up. In the past 17 years, I've gone through a lot more than other 17-year-olds, and not by choice. I would not want anybody else to go through this. I sometimes wonder what my life would be like without CF. Another young woman wrote, uh, when I was seven years old, a quick Google search changed my life. My curious mind was never the same after typing CF life expectancy and hitting enter. By now, I have adapted to that answer, but that moment lives in my mind forever. And this particular story really resonated with the other teens. And this actually, you know, I had to pause the exercise because we quickly sidetracked to a whole separate conversation. Um, I wouldn't say separate, but additional conversation about everyone having an experience like that, having, you know, recalling when they found out about this piece, and then updating the teens on what is the latest, right? What was the latest thing that we've learned about um, current life expectancy, and there were definitely some eyes that went wide in the room. 
Um, and the teens really had a great discussion about that and actually generated many act consistent themes in their discussion. Um, and just one more, uh, seventh grade, I was scrambling to figure out what to bring for the All About Me presentation the next day. I debated bringing my rock crystal collection, but decided to bring my CF book instead. It was a good thought, but not the right place. For years, people treated me differently and kept their distance like I was the flu. It made me detest what I had. But I don't think like that anymore. And um, you know, we really saw these themes through those stories of harrowing beginnings and stories of survival during their infancy, which was really consistent with the previous presentation about early diagnostic experiences. You know, these are the stories that the teens heard from their families. And this is really a cohort of kids um, who were born in the mid, mid aughts, mid to late aughts. Um, so we also heard that you know CF disrupting life in terms of the isolation that it created for them, and as well as untimely hospitalizations, but also that CF was really a big part in shaping their identity. And so when we reflected on this storytelling experience, these are the themes that the teens recognize. You know, one said every CF is different just like every person is different. And another teen said, you know, it's really hearing your story, reflecting on someone else's story, and thinking about my own, it really reminded me why I do what I do, and it's to live every day to its fullest. Okay, super quickly, I'm gonna tell you about the study. So we tested that protocol, and those quotes and um, feedback was from the actual testing. We randomized eight kids into our intervention group, as well as a um, non-directive uh, support group, and we actually had so much fun running this support group. Um, I was really worried at the beginning that the support group was gonna demonstrate to be just as effective and that we didn't need my intervention at all. Um, now, the jury is actually still out on that. I don't quite have enough data to, to say that the intervention is superior, but I do know that the kids did learn quite a bit from the intervention, so they, they did tactic and then they were switched over to the support group or they started with the support group and six weeks later they were switched over to tactic. And then now we're in the follow-up phase. Um, and what we learned, these are the sort of highlight of our findings is that really the teens found, this is what the teens said about what's most helpful. And across the board, the teens said that the biggest thing was to be in community with other CFers, was to realize for the first, it's, you know, for some folks it was like, I never realized there were so many people with CF. And people commented about just how striking it was to be in a room with other folks with CF. And then our um, post-intervention group, so after the tactic intervention, folks did comment about the skills and strategies that they learned and how helpful they thought that was. And then what was really interesting is as their participation continued, teens reported decreasing loneliness with the length of time that they persisted in group, and this did not, was not different between intervention versus control group, but for the, for teens, in terms of the timing of when they got the intervention, we did see an increase in value orientation, meaning they uh, reported stronger values in different life domains and living more consistently with the values that they rated highly, um, as well as an increase in, in psycho, psychological flexibility. And this is really key here, and I forgot to say this earlier, but the overarching target about ACT, like ACT as an intervention, is about helping people develop psychological flexibility, is about helping people getting distance from the thoughts that really, thoughts and feelings and behaviors and patterns that really bog them down. So this was one of our primary mechanisms, and to have seen some movement here, um, we're feeling really optimistic about our intervention. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there and just say that the next steps, we're gonna um, try to collect another round of um, data with at least one more group of teens going through the tactic intervention, and then currently we're developing, we're um, iterating on our user, uh, on our clinician manual. I have a snazzy little uh, QR code on our poster, but I forgot to include it here for folks who might be interested in looking at that manual and being clinician participants in our study. Uh, <laughs> to review the manual and give us feedback because we will be doing some user testing with the manual as well. So I'm gonna stop there and let folks just email me with um, interest in the manual and any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. A lot of creative intervention there. Um, 
One question uh, is related to how you recruited teens or how did you convince teens to join the group? Oh yes, um, so I don't, most of the teens didn't take too much convincing, I would say. They were either interested or they were clearly not. We did not try to convince the folks who said, this is not for me. Um, the, you know, the kids who were really on the borderline were folks who, you know, were struggling with anxiety or depression, wanted to be um, part of something that might be helpful, but really had so much anxiety that they didn't want to be on camera, that they struggled with that piece. Um, and we try to work with folks, and, and some were able to participate, and we did have at least one participant who said, not for me, not right now. Um, so that piece was hard. Um, recruitment, we recruited from our own center. We also recruited from our regional partners. And so we do have teens participating from all across the state of Washington. We did also um, get, I got sort of temporary license um, permits from neighboring states to try to include folks from Idaho and Oregon. So one question is, will there be a cost to families? I guess maybe now in the research stage or could you anticipate um, maybe some aspect of access in the future? Yeah, thank you. So this particular, this was a study, so this was all free. Um, in the future, how I would envision this, it would be billed like any other behavioral health group, behavioral health intervention, um, which currently in the hospital setting, vast majority of insurance is covered just fine, at least in the state of Washington, we have not ran into that issue. Okay, couple more questions. Um, have you considered this for siblings? Um, and I will add to that, um, are there any plans for a sort of co-occurring act-focused parent component? Oh, I love those questions. I have not considered it seriously for siblings. It certainly crossed my mind. Um, but I just decided that we were going to focus on teens. I do know of someone who's doing an act-based parent intervention. I feel like a few NACSEs ago, maybe Mary Beth. Mary Beth. Beth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so there she is in the back. <laughs> definitely UNC had the thought. Needs newborn families, right? With Mary Beth to talk about how to um, think about coordinating programs. And then lastly, what is your poster number? Oh, uh, 298. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Andrea Molzon from the University of Virginia Commonwealth, and she is speaking on Uplift, Preliminary Results of a Web-Based Group Mental Health Intervention Study in CF. does look complicated, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen the mouse. Um, I'm Andrea Molzan, and thank you for introducing me. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a similar study, but this we used adults. And if any of you are familiar with the Uplift study, you know that we have been working on this for a very long time. So we're really happy to have results to share with you today. Um, I also would like to introduce our PI is here as well, Michael Schechter. Um, so I coordinated and managed the program. Michael Schechter was our PI, and you know we've both been putting a lot into this for many years. Oh, this is just not advancing. She was not wrong. So it's okay. Is it DC? Do you click in the middle? No, it's been working on and off. Let's try that. There you go. You know, maybe if I click on the slide. It has to be the arrow right there. So it moved. Got it. All right, I think we're good. Um, my disclosures are that I receive funding support from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, so to provide some background, we've heard this before with the other presentations, but um, we all know that CF is a lifelong chronic illness and living with CF can be physically and psychologically challenging. Over the past few years, increased attention has been paid to the psychological well-being of those directly affected by CF, and we now know that people with CF report a higher prevalence of symptoms of anxiety and depression than the general population. Um, also, we know that one-on-one -on -one provider-led psychotherapeutic intervention can be effective in this, in this population. 
but it hasn't been previously evaluated extensively in adults with CF due to inherent <laughs> infection risks and distance barriers. Um, but now we have reliable, effective video conferencing technology that can help us overcome those barriers. So this study used an adapted version of an existing program, uh, namely Uplift. It is a mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy program that was originally developed for uh, patients with epilepsy due to transportation barriers experienced within that population. Uh, we kept the structure of that original program with eight weekly one-hour sessions. And it was designed for distance delivery, group delivery, and delivery by two facilitators. Um, and we wanted to keep that one of the facilitators was an adult living with the same uh, diagnosis. So one of our facilitators was an adult with CF. We updated the program to use video conferencing as our delivery method. And we modified some of the content uh, as an example. We changed the focus breath exercise to focus on skin sensations instead. And we used uh, CF specific facilitator provided examples rather than the original examples that were used in the program. The aim of the study originally was to evaluate the effectiveness of our modified version of Uplift on cohort, cohorts of adults and adolescents with CF, but we ended up having to focus only on adults because we had a lot of recruitment issues with adolescents. So it sounds like from the questions of the last presentation that that's something that some other people may have experienced as well. Uh, we hypothesized that among people with CF experiencing mild to moderate levels of anxiety or depression, Participating in our version of Uplift would help reduce these symptoms and prevent them from escalating in the future. So patients were initially screened and recruited from six participating university-affiliated CF centers in the Eastern Time Zone region of the US. Eligible patients had scores in the mild to moderate range on the GAD7 and or the PHQ9. They were English speaking, cognitively unimpaired, had no suicidal ideation actively. Those patients were briefly informed about the study, and if interested, they gave their permission to be contacted by the lead study team. Um, so that would mean I called them repeatedly until they answered. Uh, so once I, we, got up, we obtained informed consent, which was electronic, uh, participants were considered enrolled, but because we couldn't randomize participants uh, until we had a full cohort of 16 to 18 people so that we could divide them into the treatment arm and the treatment as usual arm, uh, a lot of people experienced a delay between the time that they enrolled in the study and when they could actually get started on the study. It's sort of the nature of group therapy in general. Um, and as a result, we lost 22% of our enrolled adult participants before they were able to start the study. So uh, we also weren't able to start any adolescent cohorts due to low enrollment, which you can see on the slide there. Um, and we were enrolling adolescents for the same period of time that we were enrolling adults. So I feel like that's a, a good indication of how difficult it was to recruit those adolescents. Overall, 66 total adult participants were separated into four different cohorts and they participated in the study, meaning that they took part in at least one study activity. And 33 were in the uplift or treatment group, 33 in the treatment as usual or control group. Oh, sorry. Okay, once we had a full cohort enrolled, those participants were asked to complete online surveys about their demographics, their mental and physical health and functioning, uh, and providers answered some survey questions for us about their CF health. That served as our baseline data. Right after completing baseline, the treatment group started the eight-week uplift intervention. Data collection for both the treatment and treatment as usual groups was repeated again at eight months, or eight months, eight weeks. <laughs> and that means that it was immediately after the uplift program ended. And again, six months post-treatment, and then finally 12 months post-treatment. And at each of those time points, our clinic partners completed surveys on their patient's behalf, just about some CF-specific health indicators. 
We also ask the treatment group participants to complete an anonymous program feedback survey at the treatment end time point. It just had six open-ended questions about program satisfaction. So a little more about what the intervention uplift entailed. Before starting, the treatment group participants gave us their availabilities and we chose a regular weekly meeting day and time that worked for everyone. It turns out that was typically a weeknight for most, for all of our adult participants. So that's why we wanted to keep all of our participating CF centers in the Eastern time zone. That's just something to consider when you're doing this sort of thing with multiple centers. Before session one, treatment group participants were sent a hard copy and an e-copy of the manual. And we started the intervention using a program called VC as our video conferencing platform. But after cohort one, we switched to Zoom. So we were early adopters of Zoom. Um, we've been doing this intervention since 2016. So we were on the ground floor of the Zoom hype. Um, and everyone knows what a user-friendly platform that is and it was for our participants. The structure of the sessions was fairly consistent from week to week. We had weekly modules that included built-in time for discussion, a teaching portion, and a guided activity. And each weekly module focused on a different topic. As you can see on the slide there, those of you who are familiar with CBT, this is um, pretty consistent with what's in a lot of those manualized CBT programs. Okay, our activities were designed to increase knowledge about anxiety, depression, emotional expression, and we also wanted to teach them helpful cognitive skills like using imagery, thought stopping, counter conditioning, reinforcement management, and mindfulness. The majority of participants attended more than half the sessions, which is great. And the participants who completed more than half the sessions didn't differ significantly on any of our key demographic variables from the participants who completed less than half of the sessions. But we had, like I said, we had a lot of people who completed more than half. Okay, so participant characteristics between groups were highly similar on demographic variables, common indices of CF severity, and baseline levels of anxiety and depression. Oh, sorry. We found similar numbers of participants scored in the clinically significant range for anxiety and depression in the treatment group as in the treatment as usual group at baseline. And a quick note, just to clarify, um, some of you might be thinking that our enrollment criteria, or I mean our eligibility criteria was that you had to score a five on either the GAD or the PHQ-9 and we had a lot of participants who their baseline data was below that number. Um, but as I mentioned before, there was often a lot of lag time between when they were originally screened for the study to when they participated. And those of you who are in the field know that there's a lot of fluctuations that you can expect within those scores. So it is not surprising. To test our hypotheses, we use linear mixed models with time and group as fixed effects, and we had an interaction effect for time by group. The PHQ-9 was our primary outcome measure of depression, and we found between group differences and the overall change in depression scores, that was nearly significant, the .051 level. So, you know, I hate to see that, but um, very, very nearly. We did find, in plain contrast, that there was a difference between the change in scores from baseline to treatment end. Um, between the two groups, the treatment as usual group and the treatment group. On the other hand, we didn't find that change in anxiety symptoms measured by the GAD7 differed significantly between groups from baseline to any of our follow-up points. So when we added an interaction term to see if the intervention had different effects on participants who started the intervention at baseline, clinically significant levels of anxiety or depression, we found that Yay, the model was significant. We did find a significant interaction effect, um, meaning that among participants who started the intervention with clinically significant levels of depression, the intervention did have a significant positive impact on their levels of depression from baseline to treatment end, compared to treatment as usual. Uh, also, we found that the group difference from baseline to treatment end was more pronounced in this model. And we found that 
the difference in scores from baseline to our six months post-treatment, which is, you know, that's a pretty sustained effect, was approaching significance. <coughs> so it's promising. As with the original model of the GAD7 scores, there were no significant reductions in anxiety between groups, regardless of whether their symptoms were clinically significant at baseline. Okay, um, so results from our anonymous patient feedback survey. I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but these are some of my favorite kind of results to read. Uh, in general, they were positive. The most frequent type of result of comments that we got was related to how much people just really enjoyed being able to connect with others with CF, relate with them, and share their experiences. Uh, others commented favorably about the guided discussion time, and several mentioned that they wish the discussion time was even longer. Uh, we also got a comment, this actually we got a couple of these comments, mentioning that maybe we could do more to enrich the discussion time, nudge people who are not speaking up to speak up. Okay, so in general, people seem to appreciate the structure and the format of the program, and participants liked having the manual ahead of time, and all of the comments related to our delivery platform were positive. Um, so everyone seemed to have a, a good experience using Zoom. I will comment quickly though, if you're thinking of doing anything like this at your own centers, we had a few comments saying that every participant should be encouraged to use headphones. <laughs> so one suggestion was for longer sessions and one suggestion was for more sessions. And changing the format like this might be something that we want to consider for the future. Uh, there's been some other public published literature in different patient populations uh, that have included sessions that have lasted 75 to 90 minutes in length versus our 60 minutes, and they have actually found more sustained effects uh, when it comes to treating depression. So it's something we might want to consider. And finally, uh, true to life, it seems like half of the people really loved the guided meditation portion but it wasn't for everyone, because half of the comments commented, you know, not as favorably about meditation. So overall, our big takeaway is that our version of Uplift successfully resulted in an immediate reduction of symptoms in depression in our sample of adults with CF. So we think the program shows promise, especially considering the advantages of virtual uh, group-based mental health support compared to in-person in regards to safety, convenience, and the big one, cost effectiveness. Our facilitators underwent a two-day training specifically in the Uplift protocol, but they did not have to have any sort of formal training or certificate um, in CBT or mental health care. So uh, our program design did include having a supervising clinical psychologist who would be available to provide assistance and supervision when needed. Uh, we also ensured that all of our participating centers, we had identified the mental health professionals there that um, we could contact in case we needed them to intervene. Some other benefits of virtual intervention are that the geographic barriers are easier to navigate, there aren't any, transportation issues are non-existent, and there's no need to worry about infection control. And I'm out of time, so I'll just wrap up quickly. Uh, okay, so today we focused on testing our primary hypotheses, but we're planning additional analyses. We collected other survey data related to quality of life, self-efficacy, mindfulness, um, cognitive restructuring skills, and disease severity indicators, so we'll be examining that data to help us examine our secondary hypotheses. Also, we'd like to look at the potential effects of the onset of the pandemic and the improvement of Trikafta, which, you know, <laughs> hopefully happened at exactly the same time, um, on participant outcomes. So this is something interesting. Cohort three actually finished the intervention two weeks before the pandemic, or no, they had two weeks left of the, pan of the intervention, then pandemic onset, then immediately we asked them to complete treatment and surveys. So not surprisingly, cohort three's anxiety scores, their baseline scores were here. At treatment end, they were here. <laughs> And for all of our other cohorts, there was a decrease 
in anxiety scores, regardless of whether they were in the treatment or treatment as usual group, weirdly, from baseline to treatment end, anxiety scores decreased across the board, except for, for that one cohort. So definitely need to look more into that. We haven't done any significance testing. As I mentioned, uh, we might want to consider testing ways we can improve the intervention so that we could try and promote more sustained effects. And finally, our, our ultimate goal, which I skipped ahead, is to have the program functioning as a widely available option for people with CF throughout the care network. And we'd like to thank our participating clinic partners. Very fast. Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, we definitely need these programs for adolescents, so it's so great to see a couple really promising um, interventions. So um, a couple of questions. What was treatment as usual? Um, I mean, it was essentially, that's just the term, that's what we use to term the control group. Uh, but basically what we did was if we encouraged our clinic partners that if they identified patients who were eligible for the study, um, but who were randomized into the control group, that they were provided other options, local options, so referral services, or um, a lot of our centers had sort of in-house programs that were similar, um, and we encouraged our partners to recommend those to the patients who weren't randomized to treatment. Thank you. Um, what was the ratio of men to women in your cohorts? If there were fewer men, why was that? And what could be done to have more men involved in these programs? Um, let me go back because I actually have that number, I think. But I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was 50-50. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. So it wasn't, it wasn't too big of a split, um, men versus women. And honestly, I mean, I, I would love to hear what other people think about encouraging more men to participate in these programs. I don't think this is just an issue that we should think about with CF. This is something that, you know, I, I think we've been thinking about this as a psychological community for a long time, and it, we need to continue thinking about it, how to encourage men to express themselves and especially in like this group psychological context um, as much as we do with women non-binary everyone I, I think it shouldn't be gendered thank you um i have a question so it seems like recruitment was a challenge which it often is for these behavioral studies um do you have words of wisdom for those who are embarking after your, your journey with uplift don't give up. Call someone. <laughs> call them. Call them. Call them. Text them. Send them emails. Find out what method they want to be contacted by. So as soon as you recruit them, you get interest in the study, instead of just saying, okay, we'll contact you, say, all right, we're going to contact you this week. Do you want us to send you an email? Do you want a text message? Do you want to set up a time for me to call? Um, that helps because a lot of them, I was kind of cold calling them. I didn't have any of that information, so as soon as I got them on the phone, if they were like, oh, I got to run, I can't talk, we would schedule, okay, can I text you? Can I email you? You know, I think meeting them where they are, so how do they want to be contacted and when are they available and do that? Thank you. If uplift was not delivered by mental health professionals, does that mean your recruitment was not restricted by state licensure laws? It does mean that. That was very helpful. Um, I'm not sure moving forward. I, I, I don't know how this is going to look moving forward. But this was a research study, so we had that advantage. Um, but also it was really more of a cognitive training program and kind of embedded within a support group structure. So, um, yeah, I think that could easily translate into a cross-state line practice. And oh, I've got. Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> just, oh, I, I contacted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, so we had 88% uh, attended more than half of the sessions. And honestly, beyond that, it was like 
after the 88% attended, you know, four or more sessions, it was essentially like almost 100%. For five, if they attended half, they attended the rest of them, or they maybe just missed one. Um, and part of what I realized, this was after cohort one, our attendance numbers increased because after, co it, this is when you're learning, you know, what works for people and what doesn't. And after cohort one, I realized that I really needed to send reminders in the email in the morning and then send text messages for people who are late and say, hey, I just wanted to remind you this is going on. Are you planning on joining us? Um, yeah, I think you just need to be proactive in reminding them and then very quickly reactive when they're not there to show that, you know, everybody wants them to be there. I think that was a little bit of encouragement went a long way. Um, I did. I looked at t-tests. So um, I look, because we just, it, uh, the ends were very small. Um, so we couldn't do really any, it, we couldn't separate them out from our full statistical modeling. But um, yeah, so I looked at their GAD scores at baseline and GAD scores at treatment end, PHQ scores at baseline, PHQ scores at treatment end. Um, age, I'm trying to remember what else I, 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 I ran all of the numbers and nothing s was significantly different between the groups, which is why I didn't include any of it on this slide. But, um, yeah, hopefully we'll have all of that presented, you know, when we actually write all of this up. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. And our final speaker uh, for this afternoon is Hillary Power. She is a PhD candidate in clinical psychology at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. She's presenting on evaluating the acceptability and utility of the internet-delivered cystic fibrosis mental health prevention, wellness, and resource program. Well, I'm not Hillary. But I'm Christy Wright. Um, I'll introduce myself in, in a moment, but I'm not going to repeat that huge title there. But we're very excited to talk about a program we've developed called um, the ICFPWR, or Internet Delivered Cystic Fibrosis Mental Health Prevention, Wellness, and Resource Program. First, we want to make a land acknowledgement. We hereby acknowledge the lands on which we live, study, and research are situated in Treaty 4 territory, home of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay respects to our elders past, present, and future. We have no disclosures to make. So Hillary is my senior PhD student um, at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. And myself, um, I am a professor at the University of Regina, and I'm a clinical psychologist. I won't be going through all of the um, agenda pieces, and, and most certainly I'm actually not going to go into the background per se, because we are all coming from the very same point. Um, there is a high risk for uh, mental health issues in our, this population, and high risk for families, et cetera, and there's limited health care dollars for mental health. Hopefully that's you know, changing, but really that's sort of where we're coming from. But what I did want to say, though, is wh what brought me to this. I'm relatively new to CF um, research and CF care, about six years. So my colleague, who is not here today, uh, Dr. Heather Switzer, is a clinical psychologist in Regina as well. And off the side of her desk, so about, I guess, six years ago, uh, she came to me and said, so I've been providing care now to the CF team off the side of my desk. So she is, um, she works in an outpatient um, rehab setting for children. I've been asked to come over and do these mental health screenings. But guess what? There's no service for them after. And so I'm like, what? What is happening here? This is ridiculous. And just to give you a sense of what mental health care is it, like in Canada, it's covered. So you can access mental health care, but, I don't know how many Canadians are in the audience, um, but, but, but the problem is, is that right now in particular, but before too, is that outpatient services for mental health, if you want to access them, you have to be quite high risk and elevated needs. You're not getting in if you do mild to moderate anxiety. 
So it's available in Canada, but can you get it? And so also then to those teams and those chronic illness teams, there is often not a psychologist. There's often, there may be a, a, a social worker, another mental health professional or, or a social worker that's there, but not necessarily to do mental health work. So, so she comes to me and says, we have to do something about this. And I say, yes, we do. What should we do? So we delve into the, re I delve into the research and um, my research has really has been in anxiety in children, typically functioning children, but about health related issues. Um, and up to that point, I had delved into e-health development or e-health develop, innovative development for prepping kids for surgery. So I had had sort of a sense of what maybe could be done. Um, she also said to me, you know, if service is provided and we had some financial service, we can't do it together. We can't do it in a group format. And so then we thought, okay, so can we do this in an innovative way? So the overall uh, purpose of our project, which is done in a phased approach, has had been to develop some sort of internet delivered program, but from a preventative standpoint. So not targeted, targeted to CF, but not targeted necessarily to someone who has already identified mental health concern, and for kiddos. So this is what we're focusing is on kiddos and their siblings. So here's our project pathway. So, so it's in phases, and I'm not gonna go into all these details because I have to get off here in a few minutes. But what I wanna just <laughs> show you is that the first part of this phase project, it was funded by the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation and the Saskatchewan Center of Patient-Oriented Care. Um, started with qualitative examination of needs and experiences of kids with CF, what their parents think they need, and also healthcare providers, and then siblings. So, Hillary is focused on the, the kiddos with CF, and then my other student, Shelby, focused on those needs of the siblings. And just to decide, we did start, uh, originally thought about, we did uh, focus on children and adolescents, but get what, guess what? Those adolescents were really difficult to recruit. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Anyway, so we focused on the kid population. I think rightly so. From a qualitative perspective, not to go into too much detail, this was the focus of Hillary's MA thesis. The themes that emerged from these interviews were the following. Parents, kids, and healthcare providers felt that, that these kiddos needed disease education consistent. Again, the idea that other kids would be getting that same info and we could access this information similarly as an augmentation to exi existing really good care in our CF clinics. Psychoeducation, so about emotions that you might be feeling uh, around with CF, introduction of, of some sort of coping skill set, and then social support. This though, I should mention is uh, a tenuous thing. So parents are like, what kind of social support could you provide if it's virtual, who's watching this? So like in a chat room format, like I don't, who can get in there? And so we were really aware of that and wanted to accommodate that. So in terms of the program itself, the program that came together with the, the results from those qualitative studies with um, empirical literature across areas of disease education, coping, CBT, all those things, as well as expertise, helped us design a self-guided online program for children with CF ages age 12 and siblings the same age. Um, we developed child avatars that were based in the like likeness of children part of our study. So we had um, two, Dominic and Cassidy, and they tell their stories in the program too. So you can click on and hear a little story about whatever we're talking about. And so the modules look like this. Um, CF education, uh, CF health, like how do I stay healthy? Emotions in CF, the CBT models introducing feelings, body sensations, thoughts, behaviors, how do they all work together? And it's interactive. The whole program is voice delivered and in text. And coping strategies. We introduce the basic thought, identifying thoughts, maybe changing them, talk to someone, some of these really skills that they could do on their own. To end my part, I just wanted to show a little bit about the ends of the part of staying healthy, about just normalizing the routines these kids go through. And we're just gonna see Dominic's uh, day. And we're gonna see if it works. Next, I do a pep, which is my early occurrence. I assemble my pep device. 
advice I do it. I do this in a different room, so I'm not close to my brother, who also has a seal. If I'm really focused, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes. If I'm not focused, it takes longer. After my pep, I take my bathroom powder and do it something else. Then I do my tasting. I have to assemble the equipment for my medication and then do my meds. This takes about 5 to 10 in total to do. Then I have breakfast and all the rest of my morning pills, about 12. I have to eat a huge breakfast with lots of fat and protein. Then I get dressed and brush my teeth. Then I pack my lunch in the morning and afternoon and snack and backpack. I have to take enzymes for all my snacks and meals. When I'm in school, I have to do a morning and afternoon snack ready for recess. As soon as I get home from school, I do my case for you. Then I do homework or play until supper. We eat early so there's more time to do my treatments or get activities. Sometimes I do my treatments before activities and sometimes I do them after. My evening treatments are always the same as my morning ones. I do my rest therapies and my pet and then after I case I have enzymes in a snack before bed that has lots of calories. Then I brush my teeth and shower and go to bed. I should say that Dominic and Cassidy both wrote their own stories and we gave them specific things to talk about and then everything that was voiced over was exactly as they wanted to say it. Um, so it, it, it's really personal and it really gave that personal aspect and social support aspect that the kids needed. So after the program was developed, I'm going to talk a little bit about the study we did to evaluate the acceptability and utility of the program. So the purpose of our study was to determine the program's strengths, challenges, and gather some recommendations for improving the program prior to looking at the preliminary effectiveness of the program in a different study. We recruited children ages 8 to 12 with CF and their parents as well as CF healthcare providers from CF clinics and chapters in Saskatchewan. We provided them access to the ICF PWR, and we asked participants to complete a demographic questionnaire as well as an evaluation package. Our evaluation package consisted of closed-ended ratings for different components of the program. So we looked at illustrations, content, and interactive components for each module in terms of their relevance, usability, quality, clarity, and potential effectiveness. And we also included open-ended questions to look at strengths, challenges, and then recommendations. For our analyses, we looked at the descriptive statistics in terms of the demographic information of participants. We an analyzed the ratings, so we had an acceptability criterion of 80%, meaning that we needed 80% of reviewers to provide average ratings between 5 to 7 on the Likert scales for each module before we could approve them for use. And then we analyzed the open-ended questions using qualitative content analysis. Just to briefly look at the demographics, we had seven kids and their parents participate, most of them living in urban settings, one living in a rural setting. We also had five healthcare professionals of different disciplines and backgrounds, and the average time they had spent working with people with CF was 12.8 years. In terms of our mean ratings for the parent-child dyads and the healthcare professionals, they all fell within that five to seven range. So our acceptability criterion was surpassed, meaning that we could approve all of the modules for use. And I think the most helpful data really came from those qualitative results from our healthcare providers and the parents and children. So in terms of the strengths, um, some things that they said, so the simplicity and clarity in the information, especially the information being de delivered in kind of a developmentally appropriate way for kids. Being able to relate to stories, so like, hey, you know, that's a little bit different from my treatment. I do this kind of treatment the same way. Normalizing some of the difficult aspects of CF. Um, while also focusing on some of the positives. So being able to also recognize that maybe missing school sometimes to go to clinic is okay, um, or that I get to be a part of these really cool fundraising initiatives and I get to meet all these cool people. Um, the CF-specific focus was really important and the self-directed nature of the program. To highlight, I guess, maybe the most important challenge um, that came up frequently 
were age considerations. So parents and healthcare providers seem to think that the program was appropriate for the eight to 12 range, but below that, it gets challenging with the type of information you're delivering. And then the most important thing when we were considering the recommendations for improving the program was that we had to balance whether something is actually required. So for example, if there was a mistake in describing a certain treatment versus whether it's additive. Uh, so some kids were like, we should add a lot of games. Like the games would be so fun. And it would be really cool if it was like a video game, right? But that costs so much money and we only have so much funding. So that was really kind of a balance there. So all of our modules, again, were approved for use, and currently we're using the recommendations to refine the program. For our next steps, uh, we're going to look at the preliminary effectiveness of the program, and what that looks like, we're going to recruit 10 children with CF from British Columbia uh, Children's Hospital. We're using a single case experimental design as an initial step to determine the program's effectiveness. And we're looking at the program in terms of its effectiveness in reducing or maintaining anxiety and depressive symptoms, as well as associated psychological constructs, so things like health anxiety, anxiety sensitivity, and intolerance of uncertainty. We're also looking at disease knowledge and quality of life. And we'll also be doing self-rated um, ratings of anxiety and mood during the five weeks pre-program, so that baseline phase, and then the five weeks during the program. In terms of our limitation, recruitment. I so much resonate with the recruitment struggles, the calling, the emailing, the text, whatever works for you, whatever time works for you, like I will be there. Um, engagement as well, so the time required to complete the study. We know these families are super busy. Um, we are providing $100 honorarium for study three for the families that participate. And in study two, we did a $50 honorarium, and that's been helpful. And then just thinking about a stepped care approach, this is a first step, right? This is giving a skill set to kids. Um, but after that, especially in Canada, as Christy was mentioning, you know, what is the next step for kids that require that more intensive care? So overall, the ICF-PWR may be an effective and accessible program to integrate into CF clinic care models in Canada and potentially beyond. We would love to collaborate. Um, and in terms of upcoming research, we have funding to run a Canada-wide RCT of the ICF-PWR. We're evaluating the ICF-PWR for healthy siblings currently, and we're also looking at developing a version for parents. I just want to acknowledge our funding sources as well as Dominic and Cassidy and the families and healthcare providers that participated. And I'll leave our contact info up there in case anyone wants to take a picture and send us an email. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. One question is, can you show the demographic slide again? There wasn't a specific question beyond that, um, but if there's anything additional uh, to add. For the uh, PEDS online program, did any parts of the education, like the daily routine with the avatar, have to be edited due to trichafta, or for kids who don't qualify for modulators, or is it general enough for all? That's a great question. So the program was developed pre-trichafta, so that's something also that we're thinking about, obviously including in terms of uh, what treatments are included in the CF education part. And then also some of our kiddos have started trichafta, including our patient partners. So including that in their daily routine. We do have a disclaimer in there too that like, everyone's routine looks different. You know, some treatments there, um, you might see Dominic, Dominic and Cassidy doing, but you might have something different. Uh, and everyone's CF is different, so that's also included. I don't know if you had anything to add? Yeah, pretty much that. Um, we, in, in terms of staying healthy with, with CF, one of the areas is medication. And so we, we had modulators described in that section, but we said something about, uh, and we're still undergoing future research, essentially, could be at that point, Canada didn't have access. So we, we included it, but there will be some tweaks to the program because of that. 
Is there a time frame for when this might be available to the U.S. or outside of Canada? Well, um, we are talking about some collaborations, and I have quotes on what uh, the modification might look like because we have stats that are Canadian stats that are included. There's a couple. There's not extensive of uh, modifications that would need to happen to apply to the United States. So, um, I think within the next. I don't know, I would say two years probably, we'd be able to do that based on, we'd have to allocate funding or secure funding. And this uh, question is um, specific to this presentation, but uh, has, has come up. Um, but again, uh, thinking about male participation, you know, being, uh, or low male participation being a common theme, especially for parents, um, what can we do to get more men involved? And I would say if, if other speakers have commentary on this, um, feel free to speak up. For sure. I would say that's a common theme. In our qualitative study, similarly, our demographics look similar in terms of the parents who were participating, um, most being mothers. Um, I think, you know, yeah, I would love to hear ideas about that. Um, and I think it, it's just common in lots of different studies we're reading and we're hearing about here too. Um, I don't know if you have any ideas. Is that a general question to the audience? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to open it up yeah. to the room. Oh, let's open it up. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm able to speak to that really, but I, I, don't know, think, I don't think that's the case. I think it's not being addressed. I think when we think about, met, like, if I, from my clinical practice, it's mostly moms that take their kids to see me. Mostly. So, and I think that's across the board of healthcare. So, yeah, it, it could be cultural context. Like, a, well, a whole bunch of things, but... No one's being called up. And I'm wondering, of the six women, we don't know whether single parent homes or single parent homes. I mean, it might be that the mother is the one who was completely supportive, but just the way that they're oh. breaking down the homes. Totally. Yeah. I mean, so, there was a, Hillary might know. Like, there was a mix of single family homes and then also separation, married. Mm -hmm. So very much a mix. Yeah. I think you raised a really um, important observation. There's one question right here. Yeah. So do you mean existing programs that are already available? Um, I would say no. I think every what people have been presenting here on programming that's where like this takes a long time, unfortunately. Like I feel like I've been in the, the game here for six years, and I'm like I can't believe. But but you've been describing many, many, many more years you've been working in this field. So uh, yeah, there's nothing, and you always want you want it to be evidence based. You want it to be supported in research, and this just takes time, unfortunately. So I don't know what's really out there just floating around. You might check um, the CF Education, uh, CF Foundation Education Committee um, puts out a renewed resource guide every year. So it doesn't only include written resources, um, but that's a comprehensive document that you know lists lots of available resources and options. Um, it used to be available in printed form, but I think you can probably access it through the resource library. Thank you, thank you for your presentation and thank you to all of our speakers.
If you have other questions for our speakers, you can find them um, in the NACFC app and reach out to them directly. Um, we hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference.